Order, members, and it's time now for questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Opportunity too to wish you well for the future after this morning's uh, announcement. My department became aware of an existing research study by Oxford Economics that was seeking UK-wide funding to examine the potential impact of a UK exit from the European Union under a selection of plausible scenarios. We have now accepted a proposal from Oxford Economics to join its UK study to have its work extended to Northern Ireland, following on from a formal approach we made to them during October. Mr. McKinney for supplement. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister? And while the Oxford Economics approach is welcome, uh, given the scale of the assistance uh, to Northern Ireland in terms of agriculture, infrastructure, peace, innovation, uh, would the Minister agree that the Northern Irish economy would continue to experience a net benefit from remaining in the EU? Well, the Oxford Economic study, the research is going to propose to examine a range of the potential scenarios. It's not just a simple uh, in out. The study that we have commissioned will look at, for example, the Norway option, leaving the European Union but becoming a member of the European Economic Area, or the Swiss option, which is the new settlement as a product of continued bilateral negotiation. We'll also look at the Turkey option, uh, where the UK would enter into a customs union with the European Union, similar to the current arrangements that are adopted by Turkey, and also the issue of a complete withdrawal involving a complete repatriation of powers with the UK-EU's trading relationship determined according to the WTO's most favoured nation criteria. So we look at all of the specific impacts of these potential exit scenarios in Northern Ireland across issues such as GDP, sector, trade volume, household spending, unemployment. Gordon Lyon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister tell us what the terms of reference uh, are that have been agreed uh, between the Department and the uh, Oxford uh, Economic Research Group? Well, we, we have set on them specifically to look as at what I have explained there, the different uh, options that are available and what potential impact across the whole range of scenarios uh, that these will exactly have. Because it, we, we do have to look very seriously at both the implications of in and out, and if we're in, the potential benefits, uh, if we're out, some of the pitfalls, but also some of the potential successes uh, that we could have in terms of free trade agreements with areas that we currently don't have those, specific economic zones uh, with areas that we don't have those. So let's take all the research uh, and uh, consider it in the round. We're specifically looking at a range of metrics, GDP, output by sector, trade volume, household spending, employment and unemployment, and comparisons will be made throughout the United Kingdom as a whole. And a short paper uh, exercise, access to a database detailing the results is expected to be available to us by the end of this financial year. I thank the Minister for his answers, but I note that there is no firm opinion from himself with regards to what his or his party's view is on the, our future position within Europe. But would the Minister give us an indication whether he would be willing to support the call for any decision on a referendum here to actually be binding, so that if the majority of people here vote to stay within the European Union, within the European Union that that is what should happen? Well, as part of the United Kingdom, the legality is we will be part of the United Kingdom and taking part in the United Kingdom referendum. It's the United Kingdom referendum, the clues in the title. And it comes to Jim Allister. Do you agree that uh, it would be liberating for this trading nation, the United Kingdom, to be freed in consequence of leaving the EU of the shackles of bureaucracy on our economy? And it would be liberating in terms of the growth markets which are outside the EU in that we would have the free facility to make our own trade agreements where there is growth rather than be uh, tied to the moribund EU economy which is now down to less than 20% of the world's GDP. 
All of this will need to be considered in the round. I know people have asked me what the DUP party position. I stand fully behind what uh, Diane Dodds has done, but I'm not answering questions as a DUP minister. I'm answering questions as a deputy minister. And there are a number of issues that we have to take. There are particular advantages uh, in being part of a market of 500 million people. We look, have to look at those scenarios that I outli outlined earlier to see what is the benefit, what brings in the most GDP, what brings in the most employment, what is the best value for United Kingdom citizens. And also to consider the scenarios that the Honourable Member has pointed out very well, I have to add, of what potential there could be uh, should we uh, leave the European Union and look towards what we can do in terms of free trade with some of uh, the world's emerging markets. Those points have been made well by the Honourable Member. I suppose we trained you well when you were a DUP MEP. And I call Ms Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, was glad, and I was glad to hear that the Minister acknowledged the pitfalls of being in and out. Um, but given that, the farming un, or that farming underpins our economy here, has the Minister met with any farming groups to discuss the impact of, Bre of Brexit on this industry? I met with a number uh, of farming groups uh, on a range uh, of issues. I think we've got to look towards, for example, the common agricultural policy, but we've also got to have expert opinion on what would be available to the farmers of Northern Ireland if we weren't paying the money into the European Union. What scenarios would there uh, potentially be? I understand the agri-food sector is a key beneficiary from EU membership, both in terms of as a trading partner and as a result of direct funding from the sector. But, uh, you know, and I also acknowledge too that we exported over £1.1 billion worth of sales to the European Union, uh, although the exact impact on those sales in terms of the research depends on the terms that the UK Government were to negotiate with the European Union around the movement of goods and services. Uh, the UK and Northern Ireland, as I say, would face a departure from the common agricultural policy and its related subsidies and regulations. And I know many local farmers are reliant on single farm payments to be viable. But we also need to look at the money available for them. Would we be out? Thank you. And I call the Lord Morrow. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Question number two. The Executive's economic strategy sets out an overarching goal to 2030 to improve the economic competitiveness of the economy through a focus on export led economic growth and this will remain our priority going forward. Currently, our most important sector in terms of exporting is manufacturing. And despite the recent bad news about Michelin, the manufacturing sector has been posting strong growth in output and has created over 1,800 jobs in the past year to March 2015. And it's interesting to note that the manufacturing sector has actually outperformed the UK average. So as we look to refocus the economic strategy, we will continue to invest in where the key drivers actually are, innovation, research and development, skills, because we want to create the conditions to allow business in all sectors to grow and to prosper. And that's how we'll contribute to the executive's collective goal of delivering economic growth, increasing prosperity and creating jobs. I thank the Minister for his response, and I suspect, having listened to his response, he'd probably agree with me that manufacturing jobs is the future. He has outlined that some 1,800 jobs in the manufacturing sector has been created over the past year or thereabouts. Can he tell us what his target is for the next five years, in particular in the manufacturing sector? Well, the manufacturing sector is a very vital sector, accounting for 14 per cent of all local economic output. It accounts for one in every nine of our local jobs. And I say, despite the bad news, the output last was 3.2 per cent over the year to quarter two 2015, with that output outperforming the UK average. Um, the latest Steady research on the cost of doing business showed we are competitive on all costs against the, both the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, but we cannot compete globally on cost alone. Uh, I am targeting to try and competing for 
high-end jobs, jobs that require high skills, and that's where our competitive uh, edge actually lies. So that's why I'm looking to life sciences, to agri-food, to advanced materials, and to advanced uh, engineering. And I note that the success of the members' constituency accounting for some 21% of all jobs in manufacturing. Would the Minister accept that regional targets need to form part of Invest NA's uh, corporate plan and the PFG going forward? I think what we've got to be careful of uh, the recent uh, census information. I think all of us, because all of us want jobs into our particular constituency, and that's natural. But, and I want them for Strangford as much as you want them for uh, anywhere else. But I think we have to look at the evidence from the census. And 40% of the people that are working in all of our constituencies, according to the last census, are actually working in areas uh, outside the parliamentary boundary that they actually live in. Um, so while We've got to be very careful because we cannot instruct business where to go. Business will determine based on whatever factors are there in its criterion. So what we will seek to do is to put the best case scenario right across Northern Ireland to attract the jobs in because we're conscious that nearly half of our people uh, work outside their own parliamentary boundary. My apologies, uh, Mr. McGlone. I should have called you as the chair first, but uh, t please accept my apology. Deputy Clerk, good over. We're all right. Uh, thank you. I, I, I guess my house lies in Ira Kamai. Thanks very much to the minister as well. <clears throat> much, has, much has been made, uh, Minister, uh, indeed by the manufacturing sector, of the need for a more strategic approach, indeed the development of a strategy around manufacturing. What deliberation has the minister given to that? In of a, a stakeholder type approach involving manufacturers, involving the social and trade union sector and his department to developing a more contemporary manufacturing strategy? Well, the manufacturing strategy that the five parties, including the members' own, came to was the economic strategy, uh, the manufacturing strategy within uh, ourselves and Derry is within the economic strategy. Now, I have uh, met with, with unions, I have met, uh, and some of their ideas I have tried to take forward. They have asked me specifically to do things around energy costs, and I think everyone in the House knows uh, what we did, particularly in relation to Bombardier, our biggest manufacturer. And sadly, we will never see the truth. I was ready to sign off on a three quarters of a million pounds grant investment to Michelin. Uh, in terms of trying to bring their energy costs down. Some of the work uh, I can work with uh, trade unions and others. Uh, some of the things that trade unions have asked me to do, like appoint additional junior ministers, I don't think would find acceptable to the House. But we'll work together to support them in the way they are and to continue their growth. Thank you. And before we move to the next question, can I inform members that question nine has been withdrawn? And I call Mr Leslie Cree. Question three, Mr. Speaker. In June of this year, I met with Madam Wang Ling, the Vice Governor of Hubei Province in China, during her visit uh, to Northern Ireland, specifically in relation to our agri-food sector with some of our major companies, including uh, Moy Park. I met with Madam Wang Xu Ying, Consul General of the People's Republic of China, when we addressed the China Healthcare and Life Sciences Roadshow at the beginning of July at Riddle Hall in Stranmillis, a port initiative taken forward by the United Kingdom Trade and Industry of how we can develop uh, in terms of health and life sciences. Last month I attended the uh, UK-China Business Summit at the Mansion House in London, um, which was hosted later on by a dinner with the Lord Mayor and President Xi. And at that particular economic summit, the value to the United Kingdom of up to £40 billion of investment uh, was outlined both by the Prime Minister David Cameron uh, and by President Xi Jinping. Supplementary. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker and Minister. Welcome back. You have been quoted as saying we're now in what is being labelled the golden age in UK-China relations. I wonder, could you explain uh, to us just exactly why you say that? How is golden, particularly with respect to Northern Ireland, and when we may see direct benefits in Northern Ireland from China? Well, I think 
while I appreciate attributing the quote to me, I think I was repeating what the Prime Minister David Cameron said when he talked about the golden age of UK-China relations and he talked about the uh, development of the New Silk Road. And I think the Chancellor very wisely has said how he wants uh, the United Kingdom to be the European choice of investment for the Chinese uh, government because with the trillions that are available in terms of their foreign exchange and how they invest that, we want to bring that to Northern Ireland. Six years ago, Northern Ireland was exporting in the region of 60 million pounds to China. Today, the figures for the last period are showing that we have raised that to exporting 95.5 million pounds to China. It's my intention and target to take our exports to China over 100 by the next period of office. And I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. Can the Minister tell us what potential he sees for the Confucius Institute in Northern Ireland, and how does he see that relationship growing? Well, it's a valuable relationship for Northern Ireland. It's f funded, as all the work through Ulster University and the Confucius classrooms, is funded through the UK Hanban Institute. I'd like to thank, first of all, the First and Deputy First Ministers for their support in helping us to bring that together to uh, Dolores Kelly, who is uh, chair of the all-party group in China, but also was chair at that, that period in the Department of Employment and Learning, helped us get the initiative off the ground, supported at that stage by Danny Kennedy, who was the, the minister at the time, and a very valuable uh, input that was put into Anna Lowe. What we need to realize is, according to Goldman Sachs, somewhere in the 2020s, China will become the world's largest economy. We have a unique opportunity to work alongside to try and attract the investment from what is the world's largest trading economy, about to become the world's largest economy, to attract that investment into Northern Ireland. And I'm delighted this year that from the convent school in Oma right through to Bangor Academy in my area, to Milburn Primary School in Coleraine, to the Southwest Regional College in Fermanagh, 1,500 of our young people this year have successfully passed their first qualification in Mandarin. Mr. John Dallet. Mr. Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for his answers and freely acknowledge that he's a person who would be deeply committed to human rights and religious freedom. Can he tell the House on the many occasions did he raise these issues with the uh, Chinese government? As a, as a member knows, in terms of hum, human rights, in terms of foreign and commonwealth matters, these are raised by the UK government and I fully endorse the position that has been taken forward uh, by the UK government. Anybody that knows me, I was commissioner for many years with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. I passionately believe uh, in religious freedom, both in terms of my own faith and also in the principles of the Orange Man of civil and religious liberty for all. And I will, no matter which country I'm in, will always advocate those principles. Thank you. And Mr. Paul Given is not in this place. We move on. Mr. David McElveen. Question number five, Mr. Speaker. Advanced uh, engineering business Macaulay Precision and Macaulay Fabrication are undertaking a £5 million expansion, supported by Invest Northern Ireland, which will cumulatively create 87 new skilled advanced manufacturing jobs in Ballymoney by 2019. The 87 new jobs are planned to be recruited over the next four years. It's anticipated they will generate £2.1 million annually in additional salaries within the North Antrim economy. I call Mr. Michael Veen for his supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And I'm sure the Minister will share with me um, the excellent news that this was um, to the local economy in North Antrim. However, the Minister will be aware that unfortunately it was a case of the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, and we did then obviously have a, a, a devastating announcement just some weeks later um, of the losses of jobs in Michelin. Um, I wonder would the Minister be willing um, to meet with me, uh, along with some stakeholders within the Ballymena North Antrim area, uh, in order to discuss a specific strategy as to how we can deal uh, with bringing some more jobs into this much needed area? Yes, I'm more than happy uh, to do that. I've already met 
uh, since the surprise announcement, it was a surprise for me, I think, and the unions have confirmed it was a surprise for them, um, because we have to pay tribute, and I want to do that from this dispatch box, uh, to the workers specifically at Michelin. Their output was high. My quarterly report of September was showing some of the best uh, figures ever. Unfortunately, through no fault of their own, there was a 5 million unit reduction in the tyre market, and there were costs associated with Asia that were and also to do with the fluctuation of the euro that were beyond everyone's uh, control at that particular time. So I've met with uh, unions, I've met with workers, and I also praise the fact that on Friday, as I met with some of the management, the workers were back on the floor. We have got uh, a two uh, year period right through two and a half years to uh, 2018 to try to get this right and I'll tell you I'll leave no stone unturned to try to bring jobs in to replace what's been there. And I call Mr Jim Allister. The uh, news at Macaulay's was most welcome and came against a landscape of a succession of uh, less good news stories for Ballymoney where there's been a, a downward trend in terms of employment. Uh, and though Macaulay's announcement was somewhat overshadowed by Michelin, um, nonetheless, it is of itself good news for Balmany. In respect to Balmany, what can the minister tell us about planned, scheduled FDI visits to that part of North Antrim? What we do is we go out to the companies and try to attract them. When I talk about the specific area, I, I don't just say, look, just come to this town and don't look at anywhere else. I give them the skill set that there are in the area. I get very disappointed when I read in the media about people talking about declining industrial towns and declining manufacturing. I don't take anything away from what happened with Patton's, JTI, Gallagher's or Michelin. But there is a huge good news story to tell in this particular area. That's the good news story of Moy Park, of Randox, hundreds of new jobs, of Schrader, of Wright Bus. When you privileged to sit on a bus in Hong Kong, made in Balamina. So what I would say to the member is be conscious of the fact that 40% of us work, uh, according to the census, outside our area. Let's attract the jobs into Northern Ireland and we have a golden opportunity in reducing our corporation tax to make ourselves competitive and bring in tens of thousands of new jobs. Thank you. And I call Mr. Cahill O'Hashi. Can, Can I say it was a pleasure to meet with the Bombardier senior management during my visit to Canada. Bombardier faces challenges. The management team is confident that these can be overcome and that seals will follow. It would be wrong to speculate further on what potential outcomes uh, there are of Bombardier's commercial decisions. I welcome the recent announcement by Bombardier of the Quebec government's plan to invest $1 billion in the C-Series, and I think all of us should view that as a very positive development. Bombardier Aerospace is a major contributor to the manufacturing economy. It's a workforce of almost 5,500, and I think all of us know it's a vibrant supply chain right across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, Bombardier Belfast supports almost all of the company's aircraft programs and it provides advanced engineering services to a number of third party customers. Um, so it was a very positive meeting and we're very upbeat to the future of a very quality product in the C series. Thank you and I call Mr Hoshin for a supplement. Well, I've got to come to Corio, I was going to waste the Naira, so to and I thank the Minister for his answer. But given what the Minister terms a surprise collapse of Michelin, can he guarantee that he will monitor the situation here going forward so we don't see any further nasty surprises? I can't guarantee that what happened with Michelin uh, can never happen again, and nobody in this House can give that guarantee. What I can guarantee is we'll do all in our power to ensure that it doesn't. Because what we had uh, in Michelin was almost monthly visits from Invest Northern Ireland. Uh, we put in about four and three quarter million pounds of taxpayers' money to support the jobs that were there. Um, we, we put in training support, and on the specific issue of energy, what we did is uh, tried the act where we had the tools the act, and that was with a three quarters of a million pounds grant 
in terms of supporting them in terms of renewables to bring their energy costs down. We are keeping a watching brief across a number of areas that are finding it difficult. We have people in many cases from Vest and Northern Ireland get in monthly, and uh, we are also receiving, uh, in many cases, reports, sometimes quarterly reports, sometimes monthly updates in terms of specific areas. But we'll do all in our power to protect the manufacturing sector. I'll call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers today. Does the Minister recognise, I know he's, he has made some mention, that Bombardier is um, leading in relation to cutting edge technology in composite engineering? And does he recognise the good work that Bombardier are doing in looking at alternative energy sources, especially in the renewable sector? Well, Bombardier are doing excellent work. And when I saw the C-Series uh, in production, I have to tell you, to see a busy factory floor, to see the aircraft being assembled in the final stages uh, of production, I want to congratulate the entire Bombardier team. They can be very proud, as the member rightly says, uh, of the C-Series. There's a great sense of pride across Northern Ireland to see wings that have been built in Belfast being attached to what is a game-changing uh, aircraft. Now, there's going to be challenges, um, but the management team is confident that these can be overcome and that, that more uh, can follow. In terms of what we as government have done, well, I brought legislation to the House specifically uh, to give the reassurance that was necessary uh, to the investors in terms of their renewable plant uh, valued at well over £100 uh, million. Pounds, and I'm delighted to see that the other finance has now stacked up, and we look forward to seeing this reduction, which could mean up to a quarter of energy costs reduced for our largest manufacturer. And I call Mr. Martino Mueller. Well, yeah, I want to thank the Minister and commend him on his visit to Bombardier in Quebec as well. And of course, we all echo the support for Bombardier at this time. But I wonder, uh, Minister, if you would agree with me that the commitment of the Quebec government, this uh, billion dollars invested in Bombardier, that there are lessons there for all of us here in terms of really getting behind uh, our, our industries, and in particular our manufacturing industries in this part of the world as well? Yes, I, I want to fully get behind them. I have met with uh, both, uh, I met initially with the one union particularly. I've had a series of meetings with manufacturing Northern Ireland. Um, I attended their programme here in this house where we celebrated manufacturing industry and we heard the good news about some of the things that we have done in this house that have actually been game changers that are not available anywhere else in the UK, but that has supported the manufacturing industry. And that's why I think we're seeing growth. I am open to ideas. I will continue to meet with manufacturers. I spent a period with the Chamber of Commerce um, down in Macrofelt with a huge success of SDC trailers, but I also then took the opportunity to meet dozens of the manufacturing sector and manufacturing in Northern Ireland. And I want to salute them for the growth that they have already achieved. And whatever uh, is within my toolbox to help it go forward, I will certainly apply, because we want that jobs and growth in the manufacturing sector. Previous uh, uh, answers, Minister, that you didn't want to speculate much on the, the uh, billion dollar, the bailout uh, of Bombardier and the proposed aid from the federal, I think you said Canadian. Uh, government, but could I ask him, has he made an assessment uh, of the threat of manufacturing jobs in Belfast from the impact on Bombardier uh, from the loss of the market share uh, to the Chinese state-owned aerospace companies? Bombardier has made a huge commitment uh, to Northern Ireland. I think we want to be a little bit careful before we use words like bailout, um, because I'm not sure it accurately reflects uh, what has happened. Whenever you bring an aircraft into production, there are huge challenges. Um, I'm looking at the Bombardier chart in Canada in terms of airworthiness and all the checks that they have to make. And they're fully confident that they can get entry into market by the second quarter of 2016. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on potential sales or potential discussions and joint ventures. That there's a need for commercial sensitivity. What I can tell you is the management there are confident that these challenges can be overcome 
and they will successfully enter into market in the second quarter of 2016 with what is a brilliant aircraft with its manufacturing wings here made uh, in Northern Ireland and all the support that gives to the supply chain. So I'm confident that it will be successful. That is the end of the, uh, the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topicals. And I call Mr. John McAllister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the, the Minister, and he will, of course, be aware that the Northern Ireland Select Committee are looking at the issue of the reducing the rate of VAT on Northern Ireland for tourism businesses. Would the Minister concede that that's probably unlikely to happen, uh, that we're unlikely to get that differential in rates? And what other uh, issues would he like to see? What other policies would he like to put in place if that isn't to happen? Well, I, I don't accept that just because in a reserved matter uh, people think it's less likely or more likely uh, for us to achieve something, uh, that we shouldn't continue to make the argument that we need to achieve it. Our hospitality and tourism sector is growing from strength to strength. You saw the tourism figures that were recently released, which showed our tourism up. And we have set ourselves a target of a £1 billion industry uh, for tourism by 2020. Major events will do that, such as uh, the, the Open coming to uh, Northern Ireland. With that good news, and remember, as a member will know, the the only time uh, the Irish Open's ever sold out was in Royal Port Rush and Royal County Down, with a staggering 107,000 paying spectators. Just think of what that bodes for the Open uh, coming uh, to Northern Ireland. So I think we'll continue to make the argument uh, for a uh, reduction in VAT because the case can be made uh, and well made, and we'll continue to support the sector to achieve that £1 billion target. Thank you, Mr. Bingham. I'm grateful to the Minister uh, for his reply. Um, the other issues that uh, tourism faces is obviously cuts to the arts. Does he feel that is, is a difficulty? And, what, uh, and the other challenges, particularly in a constituency like South Down, while accepting the Irish Open was a huge success in Royal County Down, is actually growing tourism, making it sustainable having jobs and increasing tourism spend. It's all of those things that he needs to address. And how would he propose to address some of those? Well, the first thing in terms of growing tourism is you want your, the industry, and I want the industry, to look at tourism and hospitality as a career choice from the very earliest onset, to give it the status that it deserves in terms of an industry that is providing a similar number of jobs as agriculture does to Northern Ireland. So the first thing you want to do is to ensure that you've got your skills base right so that the first point of contact, if the tourism research uh, informs me, is to make sure that the people that you meet, uh, that's what you'll remember, that they're properly skilled. The second thing is your tourism offering. And we have a huge offering from the creative industries. You mentioned the arts from Game of Thrones, which I note now is uh, HBO's most successful uh, series that they have ever done, right through to golf tourism, to the beauty of the natural geography uh, of Northern Ireland, particularly areas like uh, the Moran Mountains. But all in all, we need to thank the industry for the 2% increase in overall visitor numbers that they've already done for the first six months of this year. Here in the call, Mr. Gordon Lyons. Thank you. Mr Speaker, the news last week uh, about Michelin was devastating, not only for North Antrim but also for many uh, people in my own constituency uh, who work there. Can the Minister give the House an assurance today that uh, his department will continue to work with uh, Invest NI, Midden East Antrim Borough Council and the Department of Employment and Learning to ensure that support is available there for workers not only in the next few months but right up to 2018 and indeed beyond? Yes, I can give that assurance, and we have already started that. And I'd like to place on record my thanks to Stephen Farry, um, the Minister of Employment and Learning, who immediately, on hearing the news, was in my office, and we've spent several hours together uh, discussing both with the uh, Mayor and the Chief Executive of the Council what we can do, what Invest NI support can come in also to the local uh, Council in the particular area. We acknowledge the work with the Michelin management um, that people 
uh, will not be out of work until uh, 2018. And the hope, their ambition, and it's an ambition that everybody in this House should actually have, is that they can leave work to another job with a healthy uh, paycheck in their hands. So what we've got to do now, I believe, is reduce our corporation tax, set the date that we're going to do that, and attract those 30,000 plus new jobs that are available to Northern Ireland. Thanks for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? Um, there's also been an awful lot of uh, good news recently in East Antrim as well. The Minister visited my constituency on Friday, was able to see the excellent work of um, businesses there and, and a social enterprise. We obviously now have the Gobbins visitor attraction that he has, has also been to, and so we do have much um, positive news uh, as well. But can the Minister uh, tell uh, the House how many jobs have been promoted in East Antrim? Um, during this uh, assembly term, and uh, what will what can Invest NI do to ensure that em employment can continue to grow in my constituency? The specifics of the some of the issues that were raised there, particularly the Gobbins Cliff Path, and remember, in history of Northern Ireland, the Gobbins Cliff Path, as uh, Mr. Lands will be proud to know, was actually more successful in terms of attracting tourists at one period. Uh, than the Giants Causeway. And I can see uh, huge potential um, into the, the future uh, for uh, what can be done there. In terms of the specific question uh, for East Antrim, um, 672 in terms of external, uh, 33 for a period. Uh, locally, in terms of East Antrim, we have from 2011 12 to the forwarding period, 458 and 119. So in terms of jobs promoted in the parliamentary constituency area from 11-12 to 14-15 for East Antrim, uh, that sits at 1,130. And in the last particular period, that is 152 jobs. Thomas Clare Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, now that the Nairo consultation has ended, can you outline uh, what conversations you might be able to have with uh, the Department of Energy and Climate Change across the water about the future of wind energy in Northern Ireland? Yes, I was very disappointed when we consulted in the previous with the coalition government and we set out our figure of 2017-2018 that a Conservative government stepped in and immediately changed with respect of wind. Now, they changed their position. We didn't change ours. In response to that, I tried to support the farmers. I tried to support the small-scale industry. I tried to support the large-scale industry, but it fell at the first hurdle in this House, with some members telling me, we will not allow you to spend one single penny extra in Northern Ireland. Subsequent to that, DEC changed their position, and in their change position, they allowed us to bring across over 90% uh, in terms of large-scale and a significant number in terms of small scale, but others would follow, but we could socialise the cross costs across the whole of the United Kingdom. I will continue to try to do what I can for our small scale in conversations, and we are in detailed discussions and correspondence with DEC, but I have to be conscious of also the cost of energy, both to the Northern Ireland domestic person and also to the industry. Supplementary. Thanks. With, with, all that, with all that in mind, does the Minister regret his earlier statement uh, about the certainty of that funding, which did give considerable comfort to small-scale producers? And uh, I appreciate that, that there are mitigating circumstances in the UK-wide context, but can he outline what specifically he's going to be able to do to help that uh, sector recover? Well, I'm seeking to ensure the best outcomes in terms of cost to the consumer and the amount of megawatts that can be achieved. I have to take into position the changing position that DEC has taken. So they took a position A, I responded to position A in the best interest of Northern Ireland, tried to put and support the small scale and tried to put it through the committee of this House, and the committee rejected it. I then, when they came up with a position B, I tried to look at what was in the best interest of Northern Ireland, both for industry and also for the, des the domestic consumer. I mean, energy has devolved. But costs are socialised. So the issue that we need to do is take into account the three parts of what is known as the energy trilemma. You can't just go for any one particular sector. You've got to look 
at the security of supply, and we do need to get the north-south interconnector up and running, the £20 million savings uh, that we're missing out on with that project uh, being the circumstance that, uh, that it is. But we'll always have to look at both cost and also the ability of people to pay. Thank you. And a call Ms. May and, and just given the, the Minister's previous comments, could I ask, I'm aware that the Minister has met previously with Amber Rudd in terms of, of her capacity in terms of energy and climate change. Could I ask, would he be willing to go and meet her again? I, I, I will meet her any time, any place and anywhere. But the reality was Amber Rudd was a minister in the previous government. The Prime Minister was a Prime Minister in the previous government. And as a result of discussions that my predecessor had with them, we went out to our industry and said 2017 with a grace period to 2018. When the Conservative government came into power, they moved the goalposts in Northern Ireland. And everything that I have done subsequent to that and subsequent to DEX changing position is to try to drive forward a position that can ensure the Northern Ireland consumer the business customer gets best value at minimum cost. Well, and I thank the, the Minister for his clarity and, and I welcome the fact that he will and intends to, to meet again. But uh, do you take that as a declaration of your intent to go on and fight in relation to uh, those people who are clearly losing out in this regard? I have people in my own constituency who borrowed money against their own homes in order to go for renewables on the basis of what DEC had allowed Northern Ireland to do in terms of its consultation. I'm acutely aware of their needs. And when the record of this period is written, they will see that when Amber Rudd changed her position, I tried to put through this House legislation specific to Northern Ireland. This committee of this House turned down for the farmer and the small scale user. This committee turned down legislation I was seeking to introduce. When Amber Rudd changed her position, again, I tried to nuance that position, and again, the committee turned down for the small scale user and the farmer. I'm currently in discussions with Amber Rudd, both in written and with my officials, to try to see what we can do for those people. But I can only do that which is realistic and that which the committee is allowed to let the legislation go to the floor of this House home. Um, Maggot, and just uh, if I could ask the Minister, at what point did the committee reject legislation? At no point did it reject legislation. On two occasions it sought further clarification. And can I ask the Minister, is he so unaware of that? That makes for a worse situation, given the preposterously bad evidence session that the committee had around this matter on two separate occasions. I fear when a chairman of a committee has to ask the minister what his own committee did in terms of the delay in terms of getting the legislation through. Now, I have seen different members of that particular committee, including himself, adopt different positions at different times. We cannot be a chameleon and change our colours depending on who we're actually talking to. And I would tell the chairman of the committee, he cannot be in a position that, like a cushion, just bearing the imprint on whoever sat on him last. The issue was, DEC, we didn't change our position. I brought legislation to the committee. It got delayed. It didn't go through. I nuanced it. I tried to bring additional information. It got delayed. It didn't go through. And I hope the farmers out there look to that committee and look to what could have been done had they followed the advice that I originally gave it. Those people that are losing out, and members may laugh, but those people that are losing out today should take a close look at the work of the committee. Uh, well, that's, that's very good. It's, it's good we have a minister who lives in a parallel world. Um, all you need to look at, all, could I invite the minister to look at both the Hansart and the public record on a cross-party basis, unanimous basis, where the, the, the spotlight was show, shown very firmly on his department and the shortcomings of that department were incredibly crass. Now, uh, can I ask the Minister, is he prepared to be part of the solution that on a cross-party basis, with agreement of all parties today again, that we have sought to, to bring uh, with his cooperation? Not great today, but uh, okay. Fortunately, Mr Speaker, 
Sadly, the Chairman is not across the brief of what actually occurred. When we tried to do what we said we would do in Northern Ireland, it didn't go forward. And I agree there was a cross-party basis for not taking it forward. And I also agree that when I sat down with the Chairman and pleaded the case for the small case uh, farmer and those people who are suffering today, many of them borrowed against their own house. My understanding was he was supportive uh, in my room upstairs and then in the committee room, a completely different position. In fact, I was told Northern Ireland will not allow one single extra penny. And the legislation, you saw the work before the committee, it's a matter of record what I brought into the House. It's a matter of record how DEC changed their position. And I am more than happy to stand against anyone to look at what DEC proposed, what it changed, and how in every single case I looked at what was in the best interest of Northern Ireland as a whole. Thank you, and uh, time is up.